Retail's big show, the 2018 National Retail Federation, or the NRF Conference, is returning to New York City from January 14th to the 16th. For more than a century, NRF's annual convention has been an important gathering for industry leaders. Microsoft is one of the largest sponsors of this event, and this year, we are looking forward to having an in-depth conversation around home and online, front of house, back office, and connected supply. For more information about the event, visit www.nrfbigshow.com. Okay, we're going to start with the intro. You ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) One of the things I'd love to just make sure people are aware of and think about is we have this great women in business and technology tracks at all of our events now. And I'm participating in all of them across these different places I'm going. And it's just a wonderful community. And to me, it's a way to strengthen our diversity in the industry and help support each other and have those conversations about what it means to be a successful woman in technology. You are listening to the Women in Business and Technology podcast from Microsoft. In each episode, you'll hear from women in amazing technology and business roles, as well as male allies who are helping make the industries more inclusive. We are diving into programs that promote greater diversity in the pipeline and bringing you tips on how to build a successful career in a supportive community. Welcome to Women in Business and Technology. Welcome to Episode 8 of Women in Business and Technology. I'm Colleen O'Brien. And I'm Sonia Dara. On this show, we're kicking things off in our Community Connect segment with a visit to Code Fellows, a Seattle-based coding academy where I recently learned the basics of HTML and CSS. That's awesome. And then we'll jump into an interview I had with Julia White, a corporate vice president here at Microsoft focused on Azure product marketing. Finally, we'll wrap things up in our Cutting Edge segment with a discussion on male allyship and why so few men are practicing a commitment to gender parity in public. Sonia, before we get started with the show, I just want to check in and make sure that you have fully recovered from your jet lag. (laughs) Ah, thank you for checking in. Um, Barely. I just got back from my whirlwind Euro trip that kicked off with Future Decoded, a massive Microsoft conference focused on disruptive technology, and that actually took place in London. Yeah, I saw the stats. There were over 12,000 attendees, 140 Mm -hmm. sessions. It seemed like there was a lot going on across the pond. What was it like to be there on the ground? It was awesome. I had a great experience. Obviously, the energy was super high. I learned a lot. I was there because I was in charge of one of the sessions focused on how surface devices are fitting into the modern workplace. But I also was able to catch a few other sessions, Future of Data, Blockchain, and even Julia White's keynote on workplace innovation. Of course, we'll be hearing from her later in the show. Yes. And for our listeners, whether you're interested in modern workplaces, quantum computing, or culture transformation, there's great podcast and presentation content from the event. Just head to futuredecoded.com to dive in and get up to speed on the trends. Community Connect. Get involved and stay connected. Code Fellows is a Seattle-based in-person coding academy that guides people from all backgrounds to change their lives through career-focused education. The organization hosts immersive training to meet industry needs and improve diversity in the tech scene. Over 750 students have graduated from Code Fellows since its founding in 2013, and 80% of graduates are hired into tech industry jobs within 180 days of graduation. Code Fellows graduate and lead teaching assistant Izzy Bayer spoke with me about her decision to enroll in Code Fellows. I was unemployed, but previously I was a waitress in the service industry for about 13 years. I wanted to change my life. I didn't want to be a waitress anymore, and I knew that I had the potential to do something that mattered and make money and be happy and have a great career. So. I tried it out, and I really liked it, and I kept going. 
and I've never been happier. In addition to the quality instruction that she's received, the community has been a critical factor in Izzy's commitment to the program. It feels like home, and it feels like family, and it feels like I've found my people. Code Academy enrollment is a significant investment of both time and money. Izzy had some great advice if you're considering making that commitment. I would say to do your research, come visit the school, go to an admissions event, and take a 101, take a 102, and apply for a scholarship, apply for a loan, and just go for it. I decided to take Izzy's advice, and I spent last Saturday from 9 a.m. till 8 p.m. in the Code Fellows class entitled Code 101, Intro to Software Development and Careers in Tech. The day-long workshop featured hands-on training in HTML and CSS, a panel of former students, and an interview with a software developer who has been in the industry for decades. At the end of the day, my classmates and I showcased the websites that we had created, and it was amazing to remember that the majority of us had zero understanding of HTML or CSS when the day began. For more information about Code Fellows and to see all of their upcoming courses, visit codefellows.org. And now, let's get on to the interview. I'm excited to welcome to the podcast the Microsoft Corporate Vice President of Azure Marketing, Julia White. Julia, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself, your family, and also your soft career a little bit. Absolutely. So I am a single mom of two. I have a 13-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old son. And I have been at Microsoft for 16 years. Amazing. Awesome. Mostly amazing to me. <laughs> uh, I intended to be here for two years in my grand life plan, and here I am 16 years later. Isn't that how but it happens? Right. right. I keep going, we know I'll stay as long as it's not boring, and I'm not, you know, and I feel valued. So it turns out it's going pretty well. Uh, and I've had a chance to do so many different things at the company and have many careers within the company. So it's been such a great ride. Would love to know a little bit about your work-life balance being a CVP and also a single mother. Yeah. Um, any advice you can share for our audience as well? Right. Work-life balance. Got to talk about it. I talk about it as just life because it's just all one thing, really. Right. And it's all mixed together in any one time and moment. And to me, what's been essential in being able to have a career that I love and it's fulfilling and be deeply involved with my kids is being clear on what my boundaries are and not apologizing for them. And that's something that I had to learn. And it didn't just come initially. And, you know, when I had my daughter, uh, my first child, and I, you know, I love working and I would work long hours and, you know, it's fine. And I usually be the first one and last one out. And when I had my daughter, I was like, wow, I really want to see her. Turns out once you have a kid, you're like, hey, I like them. Let's go see them. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to go home and see my daughter. So I mean, I leave at five so I can get home and see her and then put her to bed and then I can always work after if I need. Yeah. But leaving at five was like, oh my God, that's not what I do. That's absurd. And so I was really ashamed. And I literally would sneak out the back stairs of the building. Literally, I would like try not to make sure no one saw me. I was slipping out the back, quietly tiptoe down the stairs into my car so that no one would know that I left at five o'clock to go see my daughter. And I did that for, I don't know, first month or so. And then I was like, what am I doing? This Hmm. is crazy. The energy I'm spending, the shame, the guilt. I was like, it's exhausting. And I'm already exhausted enough with a newborn. And I just, in that moment, I was like, this is going to break me. I can't do this the rest of my life. I want to have a career. I have a child. Um, I have to make this work. And so it was this moment where I just kind of stepped back and I'm like, what's going to make this possible? And I have to get rid of all this energy I'm spending on feeling bad and and guilted on this and just own it. So in that moment, I was like, you know what? These are my hours. I will be successful in my job. I will get my job done and I will work the hours I need, but I'm going to do it on my way. Awesome. And that works for my boundaries. And so if I pivoted instead of sneaking from the back stairs, I literally forced myself and was so uncomfortable to like walk down the hall and be like, bye guys, see ya, <laughs> whoop, whoop, Barney, you know, I'm out, right? And I was like, oh my God. But then I just, then it cleared it and I didn't have to carry any of that guilt or concern. And people knew that I was doing my job still, I was still, you know, meet my deadlines and getting yep. my projects done. And it's actually really rewarding. I had a guy who was working for me at the time come and say, thanks for doing that. Thanks for being so overt because he was a marathon runner. And he's like, I have these long training runs I need to go on. And I need to do all the day- daylight. And thanks for making that okay. Nice. And I loved that, you know, that that was the feedback I got and it reinforced that there was actually a wonderful role model I could be. And I remember at the time, my friends were like, you can be that person. You can be their role model. Do it. And I was like, okay, let's do this thing. And it's been 
I'd keep it even to now in my role. Like, no, this is an important moment. I'm going to spend this with my kids. I'm going to be there for the school play. And I can, uh, we can work later and we'll make this work and I can get my job done. And I think a lot of women carry and spend a lot of energy on the guilt and the concern. And that just eats at you. And it makes you show up less for your job. It makes you show up less for your kids. And so that to me of just being unapologetic and owning it and moving forward was really important. So you have a graduate degree in communication from Stanford. That's awesome. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Which is undeniably great training for a marketing role like what you're in now. But after college, you actually jumped into product management into it. Were there gaps in your technical knowledge? And how did you go about solving them? Yeah, you know, I had never used a PC till I got to my first day at work. No kidding. And they sat me down and they handed me a a floppy disk and a PC and said, get started. And I literally was like, I've never touched one of these. (laughs) So I was like, but I wasn't going to admit that, right? So I just was like, all right, let's do this thing. So I really, yeah, I had my communications and psychology, actually, which probably these days I use more of my psychology degree. Uh, But I really had to learn all of it. But I... I found I just really loved it. I wanted to learn about it. I liked the technology. And so I was just curious, frankly. And I guess looking back, no very growth mindset in terms of uh, going after and learning the technology space. Once I got hooked on it, I just rolled from there. So it sounds like after hitting the West Coast tech scene, you took a little bit of a break and headed back to the East Coast for a Harvard MBA. What was that like? And were you trying to look for a change or were you deciding to stay in tech? You know, I really I wanted to become an East Coaster. I think in my mind, I was like, I've done the West Coast. I'm going to be an East Coaster and go to Manhattan. And Where'd you grow up? Uh, mostly all West Coast. All West Coast. Yeah. Okay. So what I had this vision of, and my parents went to Manhattan for a couple of years when I was in college. So I got to experience it and I was like, yeah. oh yeah, let's go back. So I was specifically chosen East Coast school. I was like, let's go there. And then I went through my first winter and I was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> so I, that that's will change I realized, your opinion very quickly. <laughs> right. I'm like, I am not actually an East Coaster, it turns out, but that's okay. I learned a lot. It was a great experience. And, you know, interestingly, when I was there, it was when the, you know, Silicon Valley was booming in that time. So I was one of the very, very few technologists at Harvard. Nice. And and we were kind of these rarities. And, and we were kind of like, of course, you're going to go back to Silicon Valley. Of course, you're going to be that person. Of course, I didn't. I came to Microsoft instead. But uh. So many young tech employees struggle to understand the return on investment in leaving great jobs like Intuit to pursue MBAs. Sheryl Sandberg has famously said on Quora that MBAs are not necessary at Facebook, and I don't believe they are important for working in the tech industry. So what are your thoughts on higher education and its relevance in the tech industry? I think it's a personal investment, Uh, I think regardless of what industry you're going to. I think all education is about investing in yourself. And of course, you could, I could be successful here at Microsoft without an MBA. No one, probably even most people don't even know or care that I have an MBA. And that's fine. I like that. Uh, But I also think it's incredibly valuable in terms of, particularly as a woman, if I wanted to change jobs, if I wanted to take time off and, you know, spend time with my children or something and come back into it, having that credential and having that network is a hugely valuable thing. And so I think you know, if you're moving around or you're trying to break into new places or you're trying to have a, a non-traditional path forward, I find it incredibly valuable. And then there's just, you know, I learned a lot. <laughs> okay. So in terms of pivoting career, things like that, very helpful, but then learning a lot, networking. Yeah. Very valuable. That's yeah. Great. So I would I would do it again. And it's fun. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you? <laughs> so before we dive into your career a little bit more, I understand that you have some plaques in your office that were in your father's office as well. You were talking about your father earlier. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a little bit more and share any stories or perhaps some leadership lessons that he might have passed on to you? You yeah. mentioned a little bit. Absolutely. You know, I have this memory of being a child and he always had these two plaques in his office. And so when he passed away a few years back now, I was like, I want those plaques. So that's why I have them in my office. And they're good stories in both of them. One, The first one says, when two people in business always agree, one of them is unnecessary. <laughs> and I love that because to me, that is the essence of diversity yeah. before we haven't had like diversity and inclusion uh, kind of conversations. It was like, fundamentally, we need to have different points of view to get to the right answer. And I always encourage, and I need it myself too, of like, what are all the different ways we could solve this problem? Because if we all just have the same group think, then it's going to be no good. And, you know, my dad would tell me stories of Kennedy as president and having too much group think. And, you know, um, and that was to me is I keep that and I ask people and I I put that in my office. People know they should. should, And I encourage them to disagree with me. That's kind of the, the role there. The other one, it says that good things come to those who wait, but only what's left by those who hustle. And to Love me, that. I know. <laughs> yeah. And that to me is, again, when modern day we talk about grit yeah. and we talk about resilience and, you know, gotta, you got to hustle and get things done and lead and do uncomfortable things. And, you know, those two things represent those two ideas for me. No, I love that. That's that's great. And I can imagine seeing that on your wall every day. It kind of keeps you, <laughs> keeps you grinding, which is great. Do you mind telling our listeners a little bit more about your job as a marketing CVP and what does your day-to-day look like? 
You know, it, it varies widely, but I'd say, you know, my energy is mostly spent helping ensure my team has the coaching and guidance and decision-making that they need and that I'm kind of getting out of their way but in, and helping them where I need. And then I, I have a deep, deep focus on storytelling. Awesome. I think the essence of marketing at some level is storytelling. And, of course, we have to think about pricing and licensing and that. But ultimately, engineers craft the product, and marketing drives the perception and understanding of that product. And at the very root of it, we're human beings, and human beings like stories. Yep. And when we can do that really, really well, it turns out a lot of other things come into place. So you're in the Azure group and obviously a very big, cutting-edge, interesting technology. And right now, we've seen that it's really attracting the tech elite, which um, there's been a bias towards men. Um, is that something you're aware of in your role? And um, have you seen a kind of skew towards men? And do you see this in the ranks that you work with among marketing and engineering? I think all commercial technology, which Azure is, um, which I spent the past 16 years doing, it can be very uh, male-heavy in terms of the both our customer base as well as the engineering team that builds it. And so certainly have seen that. I've seen it change, too. I oh, have good. seen it evolving, which is great. I think about even Scott Guthrie, who leads the engineering side of things, and he's got many women on his direct reports. Awesome. And I don't think, you know, if we look back several years, it, wouldn't, it didn't look like that. And so I think as I look internally in the work we're doing, and just frankly, the strength of the female leadership leaders of the company or speak to having that kind of a bench now. Also working with our customer base, too. I think that we still have work to do in terms of the IT industry right. being more you know, more diverse from a female and male representative perspective, but certainly something top of mind. Awesome. I've never found it to be an unfriendly place as a woman, though. That's good. At all. And so you're saying that it's improving a little bit more the percentages and... Yeah, I think the stats aren't awesome, right? But they're getting better. And it's only internally we've made some nice changes. So for sure, internally, things will look different. Despite being few women through the years in commercial technology, it's always been a very welcoming experience for me. Um, and before Azure, you were on Office, and you had a very big launch in March of 2014, the Office for iPad launch, um, which was a huge deal for us at Microsoft. And you were praised for not only your awesome demo skills, but also your sense of style by uh, Mashable editor Lance Ulanoff, who tweeted, quote, I think Julia White's very cool leather jacket should have its own Twitter account, <laughs> end quote. And by the way, those of you who can't see us in the studio right now, she's wearing an awesome leather jacket <laughs> with us today. Um, so we've talked a little bit about personal style on this podcast and how it can contribute to confidence. But given that tech product launches don't typically spark fashion discussions, mm -hmm. I can't help but think about this comment through a gendered lens, right? Yeah. So if a man had been wearing a leather jacket, do you think someone would have made the same comment? So right. how do you feel about this comment? And did you in any way liken the comment to the media's obsession with the appearance of women, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to like politicians and how everyone's commenting on Hillary's you know, right. pantsuits, things like that? So we'll love your thoughts on that. Yeah, I would say there is certainly, in my experience, truth in that as a woman, people will evaluate my looks more than we would see with men. So that's true. Um, I do think in general, though, human beings evaluate each other based on looks and not, I think that's just a human thing. It was interesting, a nonprofit foundation did a bunch of research and they showed that the kind of millennial generation doesn't have biases based on race and gender and other things that, you know, older generations might have had, but yet there's still biases based on appearance. Hmm. So it, it, it seems to be a very human instinct that we're dealing with here, which you know, kind of you have to understand versus take personally. Yeah. And that's how I think about it. Ultimately, as someone in the public eye, I think people look for authenticity and confidence. And if your style accentuates that and works with that, I think it'll be a favorable thing. If, you know, people see that maybe you're looking or dressing or trying to be something that you're not, people will call you on that. So right. I think as much as, you know, there was fashion, blah, blah, it was really about whether it was authentic and whether it was really me. And I'm still wearing a low jacket. That is what I do. It wasn't like I put it on something phony for this event. And so I think that's right. what people, what resonated with people and what does doesn't resonate with people, whether you're a man or a woman, uh, from those kind of situations. There was this article, we actually just mentioned it in our previous podcast, Women in the Workplace 2017. Mm -hmm. The study was by Lean In and McKinsey, and it revealed that women are 18% less likely to be promoted than their male peers. This has compounding effects. Only 21% of C-suite roles are held by women. How do you tackle statistics like this on your team and ensure that there's an awareness of these biases? And how do you defend against these statistics playing out on your team? 
it's such a good topic and such an important one that this is where I'm a big believer women need to help women and men need to help women too, but women need to help women. And this is one where we can make a big difference in recognizing these biases, which are almost always uh, some conscious or unconscious biases and, and kind of micro inequity level. These are not gross uh, inequities happening in this place. And um, a couple pieces of it. One is that women, uh, we need to take stock of how we show up. And I think this is true for men and women, let's be clear. But I think women are more socialized to do things when they speak and make a statement instead of saying, this is what I think we should do. They say, this is what I think we should do. Mm. And that makes it a question, not a statement. And there's this great, you know, anecdote of you go to the doctor because you're not feeling well. You walk in the room and someone says, how do you feel? And someone says, how do you feel? Which one's the nurse? Which one's the doctor? It just, it could be man or woman, but it's, there's a sense of ownership and confidence and, um, knowing your business. And I think making sure women are aware that those kind of things can lead to people viewing them in a certain way. And I see this with men, too, to be clear. So it's it just, I think, happens with women more often. So there's those things that, you know, I've worked super hard to take all of that kind of da-da-da, da-da-da, yeah. out of my language. I've just beaten it out of myself. So there's nice. something we can all do. But then there's recognizing it in the system. And I absolutely see in it, and I have absolutely seen change. So great example. On my team, when I joined in the Azure team a couple of years ago, there was a really talented woman, at least I was really impressed with her work. And we got into the people review, and she had, you know, the two levels of men above her between her and I. And they would say, yeah, she's great, but she's a little emotional. Um, mm. She's great. Or, but she kind of, um, she has to, like, vent a lot. Or, blah, blah. and I was like, huh. And so I was like, how about we stop talking about her style? How about we start talking about her impact? Yeah. What has she done? Her work. What has she accomplished? Yeah. Let's not work and focus on how she's done it here for just a second. And suddenly it cut through all of that. And like she's killing it, right? She's having a huge impact. She's solving problems. She's breaking through boundaries. And I was like, fine, if there's a style thing that is causing her to be less impactful or create, you know, chaos in the team, then that's feedback to her. But that's separate of her impact. And really helping people just even have language around that, that there's style and then there's impact. And if we're going to have, you know, back to my, my father's plaque, you know, different voices and different points of view, then different styles come with that. And that's great. And we shouldn't look at it as bad or wrong or ineffective. We look at it as diversity and perspective. And then let's look at the impact that comes from that. And honestly, I think you just need to create a language and an open conversation and yeah. a comfortable way to have that conversation within the team. And that's certainly what I've done. And that, as that, an example of that individual is now a senior manager on my team and has done incredibly well. Um, because, you know, in that moment, I was able to identify that educate my team and champion her. And so I think those are examples of that. Nice. You mentioned about the upward intonation and kind of not being super sure. And I would love your thoughts. This has been an article that circulated at least on our WDG threads before of mm. including emoticons or emojis mm. and emails or using the word just, mm -hmm. like just checking in to see as it's almost yeah. like you're like tiptoeing and not sure if you're yep. um, bothering the person. What are your thoughts on that? And if that's someone's natural way of asking, should mm -hmm. they change it or should they be more assertive? And then I know the emoticons was a big thing that people are like, does that make you less professional? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a gendered lens on that as well. Yeah, you know, it's it's a tricky one. And I, I'm i a believer that you have to be uh, responsible for how you show up and the norms that are within the organization. And yet, and I also am not a promoter of assimilate, uh, right? And so it's this, it's this interesting balance that I, you know, I'm probably going to talk out of both sides of my mouth for just a second on this one, but that's that's a reality of life. So there are things that human beings can do to make themselves appear less capable, less competent, and less confident. And those things are what you suggested of da da da, da or I think we should do this versus we should do this. Right. It's just it's saying the same thing. It's a different way of saying it. And I think knowing what power you hold has a big indicator of whether that's the right or wrong um, approach. So as an example, I've been coached to say more of, I think, versus we should do this um, because I have a certain personality and I'm a certain level. And, you know, and and that comes with power in itself. And so you have to compensate for that by because if I'm in a powerful position, if I'm also super you know dictatorial, it'll feel like everyone just has to run versus like, no, I'm just actually ideating. What do you guys think? Um, and so this is where I see, again, men and women do this. I think it shows up with women more. And uh, based on social norms, that was part of our society that we I don't want to ignore. And yeah. it would be naive for us to ignore. And so there is some accountability and, unfortunately, more burden that does fall on women to be recognized and then decide what to do about it. Again, if I go back to you, humans um, really smell out authenticity yeah. and they smell out competence and confidence. And so 
I use emoticons and, you know, sometimes I think, huh, is that too girly? And I'm like, I don't care. And I'm like, I'm also in a place where I feel like I've got enough power that it doesn't matter. But you have to be thoughtful on moments of that. And, you know, so for example, I was very conscious when I started working at Microsoft of what I wore. I was one of the few women in that division when I started in servers. And I didn't want to stand out too much. I just wanted to be me, but I didn't want to stand out too much. So there's a balance, right? I'm trying to walk that of both being authentic to you, but also understanding the norms that you're dealing with. So you mentioned being at a higher level, you almost have to tone it the other way, right? Right. For someone early on in their career, though, would Mm -hmm. you think that they should do a little bit more of the less I think and I recommend we do this or we Mm -hmm. should do this Mm -hmm. um, emojis? Like I'm thinking of like Microsoft Academy College hires coming in, ACE hires, right, right, who are still unsure of what they're doing, but how do they come across of still being confident, but mm-hmm. also they're learning. Yeah, I, I think you, you always want to demonstrate you're competent. And competence means that you know what you're talking about. You believe in what I'm talking about, and you're like, I have data. I'm not just like, hey, here's my opinion. Like, no, this is what we should do. But I also think you should have personality. Like, I, you know, I hate for us all to be robots and, like, no emoticons <laughs> and, no, like, let's be humans, too. Like, that makes our workplace fun and our customers and our products better. Um, so I'd say bring your personality, but don't trade it off at not looking competent. And again, that my, I don't have black and white lines on that. Um, That's great. But I would say that would be my, my general rule. Okay, good to know. Julia White approves emojis, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a user of. <laughs> awesome. Um, so there's been some talks about how job descriptions through a gendered lens can affect the type of candidates that you can hire and what they would actually be attracted to. Have you seen any improvements? And I can imagine for Azure engineering and marketing and how some of those lenses of JDs or job mm-hmm. descriptions would be written Do you see improvements and is it really that simple of trying to add in maybe a few more words that would speak more to women or anything like that would actually impact it? Yeah, you know, there's actually some pretty cool online tools that even will just you drop your job description in and it tells you whether there's words that are um, kind of have gender biases or not and will attract different kinds of talent of different ethnicities and different genders too. So I think, you know, looking at the language in your job description, the interesting thing that I love is that I've found that the things that come back as, hey, more gender neutral, more likely to attract women. women and minorities also attract people more of growth mindset or people in the growth mindset. So I was like, oh, how interesting that that has a, a, you know, a a multiple effect on, on that one. So I think it's something certainly to be aware of. And getting the job description to be appealing Super important. And being cognizant of things that women tend to not apply for jobs unless they're fully qualified, where men will tend to apply for jobs even if they're not qualified. And so that's also in screening the candidates and pulling people up and saying, hey, I know you don't have 10 years work experience, but I think you're right. You're, um, and giving them that confidence is important. But actually, in terms of the like getting great candidates in and making sure we have and uh, retract and retain and diversity is making sure they – interview and meet people that look like them, whether that be um, a lesbian person that may be a black person, maybe, you know, someone from Asia. It doesn't matter, but someone who really reflects them in that process. So they know, like, I'm not the first one. And there's a and it's a culture that will um, listen to me. And then I have a voice in this culture. So I think that is really, really powerful. And then with that is also human. Again, if I go back to my psychology degree, human beings tend to hire people just like them. And it's not because we're bad or we're racist, but we just, we hire like people. It's just a human instinct. And so just, I'm like, own that. Don't be ashamed of it. It's just a human thing. (laughs) Once you own it and accept it, then you can do something about it. So I know that. And so on the interview loops, you have to have diverse perspectives. You have to have diverse people. Otherwise, you're going to get people who just look the same and talk the same. So I think really understanding that and getting that and just accepting it versus being like, no, no, people aren't like that. I'm like, yeah, they are. They're humans. Just move on. Let's do it. Recently, we just had a conference, Microsoft Ignite in Mm -hmm. Orlando, and you had a chance to meet our former float. Yes. Michelle Obama. Do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Uh, first, she's awesome, which was great. But, um, you know, so many different interesting points she made. But the one that I think is, you know, imp- kind of resonated with me is the diversity of slates and the network, right? And she made this point talking to Brad Smith, you know, our president um, in legal affairs, of, hey, my network looks a lot different than your network. And so my ability, he's, she's like, I bet I know a lot more black women than you do, and, <laughs> and which was funny, but true. Hilarious and, saying that to Brad Smith. <laughs> yeah, to Brad Smith, right. <laughs> but that's the truth in the organization, too, of, hey, if I bring in diverse people, they have a diverse network. They also represent a diverse customer base, which is our truth. And so I think that to me, um, when you really understand that that diversity gets us the best outcomes and gets us the business results, which I love now seeing hard science proving that, uh, gets people to believe, no, it's just the right thing to do versus, you know, there's bottom line impact in that. And the only way you do that is having these different networks that you can tap into. 
With the prevalence of code academies and free resources online, technology continues to democratize year over year. Do you think that the tech world will continue to provide jobs to people who don't have a background in any technology, even as the tools and language become more pervasive and accessible? Absolutely, because I think about myself. You know, I had an undergrad in communications and psychology. Like, how am I leading Azure? And so it's true for me. It has been. And I I actually think that this shift, uh, you know, I call it democratization of technology, is really great for women. And, you know, I didn't have a STEM background, but yet I'm in technology. And, you know, people, I think most human beings would consider me pretty deeply technical. Yeah. And because I get curious and I was learning, people were willing to share with me. And I think the next generation coming up is much more technology advanced than certainly my generation. And so they're already more fluent in it um, but just because technology is so much more pervasive. And then also the technology is becoming, with cloud, you're not having to rack and stack servers and, yeah. and have understand all those pieces of it. You really just spin up an API and write code against it. And that's something... You know, my, my kids program on Minecraft, and it's awesome. absolutely within the reach, and they've never taken a class on it. It becomes much more innate to them. And so I do think it opens up a lot more diversity versus just looking at a traditional STEM background for feeder into technology that it becomes broader. And I think that's great from making tech more diverse. We've referenced uh, Marion Wright Edelman's quote on this podcast so quite frequently of, you can't be what you can't see. As a successful woman in technology, do you feel the pressure to have a public persona to demonstrate to women overtly that your path is possible? Uh, I don't necessarily feel pressure, but I think it's an opportunity. And, you know, interestingly, as an, an anecdote, I used to be terrified of public speaking, like absolutely That's hard terrified. to believe. <laughs> I know, really. Like I tell people the story because I'm like, I, if I can overcome my fear of public speaking, so can you. I did it because I thought it was important and I thought, you know, I, had, I wanted to share my story yeah. in terms of my technology and the impact it can have. And that's what pushed me into being more public. But then when I saw the response, it was so powerful in that people were hungry to see a, a senior woman and talking about technology and demoing the product. And I thought, gosh, this is something I can do. And this is a way I can help. And so to me, it's all opportunity. And I get up there and do it because I want other women to know they can do it too. And I wasn't born great, let me tell you. <laughs> Woo! Uh-uh. Um, I'm on the next of public speaking. Um, and other ways too, let's be clear. <laughs> a lot of work. Uh, but I think to me, it, I, if you're a female in technology and you're willing to do it, it's great because we do need more people out there and people look up and say, oh, that can be successful too. Again, I think it mattered to me. It matters to people coming up. And so if I can help, great. That's awesome. I know Twitter blowing up after any presentation you've done, but specifically the one that we had at Inspire, yeah. where it was you and three of us other women mm. who were presenting with Satya. And it was very positive what I saw of at yep. least like, hey, there's four women on stage presenting, which was nice to see and kind of the camaraderie being built around that. Uh, we just had our big customer event, Ignite, and we had a, many, many, many women presenters. And, you know, there was a bunch of Twitter on it. And there was some question of like, oh, did, you know, thank you, Microsoft, for focusing on it to like, hey, is that artificial? And, mm. you know, we manufactured women on stage. And I was like, gosh, are we? And I went back and I looked and it wasn't true. Every yeah. one of those women on stage was the expert in the area, the engineering leader and that. Like, and I was like, wow, that to me was a moment of reflect. So, of course, I was back on Twitter like, nope, not artificial. This yeah. was actually just how it worked out. We have that many fantastic female leaders. According to a study by NCWIT, 57 percent of professional occupations in the 2016 U.S. workforce were held by women. But women held just 26 percent of professional computing jobs. Mm. That number has remained relatively static over the past several years, unfortunately. How has your relationship to that statistic changed since you first entered the tech world to now as a very successful manager of people and a very critical business? Right. You know, the stats haven't changed, which you could get super depressed about. And I, you know, I think about my daughter coming up and she's super interested in science, math, and computers. And I'm like, God, I haven't left the world better for her. But I, it's not done. I'm not done yet. Not done yet. Not done no. yet. Here we are. And sometimes there's like the, the final blocker is the hardest. And then you, you see the wall break. The interesting thing is I reflect on while the stats haven't changed, my experience for sure has. Like when I first started 16 years ago at Microsoft, I was the first woman to ever have a child in that division. Whoa. Yes. Wow. Right? And like okay. no, my, no one in my management chain had ha dealt with someone going on maternity leave. Like wow. I was there first. And so I was like, well, there wasn't even a language around it. Yeah. Right? Like, okay, how much time are you taking off? Like it was just like they were everyone was friendly about it. Right. But it was this foreign thing. Yeah. And there just wasn't any level of real conversation happening about diversity and inclusion. And now I think about where we are 16 years on. Maybe the stats aren't 
a lot better. But man, we have language around it. It's comfortable. We're so much more educated about it. Uh, and so that to me is the basis of real change coming. And that, you know, we've we've stopped pretending and trying to ignore it or like hope it away to like, no, let's embrace this thing. And to me, the pivot is now that we understand um, the diversity in general and diversity of thought and perspective drives business outcomes, now that shifts. Like suddenly it was from like, ah, right, nice thing to do to the right thing to do to like, oh my gosh, we have to do it or we're not going to be competitive. Yeah. That's the shift that I see. What would be your advice to women who feel like they may be being underpaid? If you, they think you're underpaid, you probably are. I'd start with that. You know, um, and it comes back to fundamental, frankly, negotiating skills. And interesting story is when I was at Harvard Business School, we had a negotiations class. And they show you all this, you know, the statistics about, you know, men do better in the negotiations than women and blah, blah. And so, of course, all the women in the class were like, well, yeah, maybe in the rest of the world, but certainly not at Harvard Business School. And so we all did our negotiation exercises and went through the process. And guess what? Women fared 50 percent of what men did in the negotiations at Harvard oh, Business man. School. Right. No better. <laughs> like, we were, like, horrified. And I was like, geez, if we can't do it here, then what's going on? That proved to me that it is true and it is is a real world thing. So if you are feeling underpaid, then balls in your court on this one just to do something about it. And that's about how to have a productive conversation about really getting some data about what your work value is. And now there's luckily some great, you know, services online you can go see and compare yourself and get some data versus in the past, it was kind of just like guessing and asking friends. So you can go get armed with data. And frankly, you can go interview and look at other jobs and see what kind of offers you're getting or what kind of salary uh, their options are. So then with that, then you're armed to actually have a database conversation with your management team to say, hey, I think this is the kind of value I'm bringing, and this is the kind of compensation package that I think is according to that. And there's lots of wonderful ways to do that. There's lots of terrible ways to go about having that conversation. So um, being thoughtful about having that conversation with your management, and it's never a, like, never wait till you're so upset and you're so, I call it hygiene issues. When it's gotten so bad, it's a hygiene issue, and you go in and you're like, I need a raise. Like, that's never going to be productive. Just like if you go to a friend and you're super angry at them, you know, it's better to to address that earlier. So going in and saying, hey, here's what I aspire to, and this is what I like, and this is my my career success, and I'd like to be making this much money. And how do I do that? And start there, and then keep pushing from there. I wanted to pivot and talk a little bit more about this social media movement that's mm. recently surfaced, the Hashtag Me Too project, founded by Tarana Burke about 10 years ago. But it's regained momentum recently when Alyssa Milano used her Twitter account to amplify the movement. Yeah. The hashtag has been used over 2 million times on Twitter alone. And I would love to know a little bit more about what has been your message to your team in the wake of this movement and any advice you would have for women who are considering a job in or a commitment to the incredibly male-dominated tech industry. So it's certainly an important topic, and I'm really glad that there's a public conversation going on about it so that it creates the opportunity to have the conversation, which is the first step on any of these type of things. Um, you know, I, I'm so thankful. I actually don't have any kind of first-party sexual harassment stories to share, and but it's super clear that I am in the minority, and that's not okay. Uh, and certainly we have a lot of work to do on it, and again, having the conversation is the first step. And then making sure that you, as a leader, and like, as myself, that I am having a zero tolerance for that. But to do that, is saying that's one thing, doing it's different. And that means you have to have, you know, you have to be aware of what's happening in your organization and you have to be attuned to it. You have to take claims really seriously and make sure that there's a safe place for people to come and tell you. And I've had that, you know, a few times of having a woman come to my office and share her story. And I'm like, I'm on it. And absolutely take it super seriously and take action. And I feel, you know, I feel very fortunate Microsoft has such clear policies and support around this. So it's been something that's been handled incredibly well here. Again, I think as technology industry, we have a lot of work to do in terms of what we've seen in the media and other things. Clearly, there's more problems to kind of ferret out and understand in that place. Reporting it and making it known is a an invaluable thing. It can be really uncomfortable for yeah. the victim. And so I'm also like... You know, you out of each circumstance is a little bit different in that I'm never going to tell a victim like, hey, you have to go do this if that's something that they're not. They've already been through a lot. And so let's be thoughtful and considerate of their world, too, versus like take a stand. But, you know, in an organization like Microsoft or others that's supported, man, take that up. Like, absolutely, because there's incredible support around it. Sadly, I can't say every organization is like that. Yeah. And so you have to make that decision. But if you can make a change and you can stand and um, have that resolved, then absolutely that's your best path. But if it's not, and, you know, these stories that I'm reading online and these really uncomfortable stories of, like, you know, months and years of discrimination and mm -hmm. harassment, like, man, that's a really uncomfortable place to be. So, Julia, any final thoughts? 
just coming off the heels of our Ignite conference and then heading into three conferences in November, uh, it's certainly <laughs> top. <laughs> yeah, right. Certainly top of mind. And one of the things I'd love to just make sure people are aware of and think about is we have this great women in business and technology tracks at all of our events now. And I'm participating in all of them across these different places I'm going. And it's just a wonderful community. And to me, it's a way to you know, strengthen our diversity in the industry and, you know, not just at these events, but in the industry and help each other and help support each other and have those conversations about what it means to be a successful woman in technology. So I love that. I encourage people to participate and I'll certainly be as many as I can possibly be at. So, Julia, where can our listeners find you online? The place I spend most of my time is on Twitter, which is, my handle is at J-U-L White, Jewel White. And uh, that's the best place to reach me. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cutting Edge, our take on stories in the business and technology world. We are diving into an article that was published in mid-October in Harvard Business Review. The article, written by David G. Smith and W. Brad Johnson, is entitled, Lots of Men Are Gender Equality Allies in Private. Why Not in Public? The article first sets some ground rules, citing the research of Deborah Meyerson and Megan Tompkins with the National Science Foundation's Advanced Program at the University of Michigan. They found that allies need three traits in order to create institutional changes that support diversity. The first trait, they must have insider knowledge of the organization. The second trait, they must show a genuine understanding of the cost of inequality for everyone in addition to the organizational bottom line. And the third trait, they must demonstrate an honest commitment to what is right and just. You're probably thinking, hey, I know a lot of men who have all of those traits. So why are so few of my male friends vocally or actively committed to the cause? The article goes on to describe the three unconscious processes that, quote, create timidity and perpetuate silence. The first of these processes is the bystander effect, when a group of people witnesses something unjust and they tend to think that someone else will act. The second process is conformity, the desire to belong to a group of people which can prevent us from acting against what we think is the majority opinion. The third process is psychological standing, or the sense of having skin in the game. Many men don't want to overstep any unspoken boundaries to advocate for gender parity because, as men, they don't think that it's their place. Research shows that interventions can be helpful in overcoming these social psychological processes. But the article asserts the importance of reframing gender equality as a leadership issue instead of a women's issue. And it's because it's the leaders who are the ones responsible for demonstrating integrity and creating a safe work environment. Personally, I really appreciate this reframing. While a company may have some staff dedicated to diversity and inclusion initiatives, it's really up to everyone to commit to a workplace that values different experiences, backgrounds, and thinking styles. While getting every company employee committed is a tall order, charging our leaders to demonstrate active advocacy feels like a strategic first step. Leaders are visible, and they can prompt change. So unless male leaders are publicly practicing their allyship, we can't expect that their direct reports will feel empowered to demonstrate any commitment to gender parity. If you're committed to male allyship, consider this challenge. Practice being an ally more loudly, whether that means, hey, you're advocating for a company benefit that doesn't directly impact you, or ensuring that no one on your team is routinely interrupted. That's a start. You can do it, guys. I believe in you. All right, Sonia, I have a meeting in 30 minutes. I know you have to get back to work, too, but I have to say I'm really proud of the episode that we came up with. Me, too. I agree. And to our listeners, if you agree, you should let a friend know. We always appreciate getting new fans of the show. So if you know someone who would like this podcast, tell them to check it out. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. As always, if you have any feedback or questions, 
please email us at wibt at microsoft.com or tweet us at Microsoft Women. As communications professionals, it has nagged at us a bit that our sign-off hasn't been totally crisp for the first few episodes. So, with that in mind, we're going to start wrapping the show with a more distinct call to action for our listeners. And for this episode, that action is, drumroll please, to try your hand at coding. There are a ton of great courses that you can access for free online. Your assignment until next time, head to code.org, click on the Learn tab, and try out an hour of code.